Okay, good afternoon. My name is Libby Sherwin. I'm a pediatric cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Children's National Medical Center, and I'm very excited to be able to talk um, today about arrhythmias. Um, I tend to get very excited about them, so I will try not to overdo it. This is a really broad topic today, but I'm happy to be able to start the discussion and then always happy to talk more at future times. Um, today we're going to talk about arrhythmias in children. Uh, with three broad topics, which could each be a lecture on their own, but how common are they? How can we monitor for them, and how can we fix them? So electrophysiology, of course, is the study of the electrical properties of any biological cell, but here in the cardiac cells and tissues. Um, we typically think of plumbing problems when we think about congenital heart disease or pediatric heart disease um, with anatomical malformations. That's the most commonly spoken about or probably the most awareness in the general community. But there's actually a lot of arrhythmias, both in children with anatomical heart disease as well as in children with totally normal hearts who are otherwise healthy. And there's a wide range that can be completely asymptomatic, may cause minor symptoms to pretty significant and severe symptoms, and much less commonly but also possible is life-threatening arrhythmias. So we're going to go through these a little bit. Um, please feel free to interrupt with questions or send a chat message with questions that I can address at any time. So the heart disease, electrical heart disease that we see in pediatrics, it's basically the same as anything that can be seen in adults with slightly different frequencies, slightly different etiologies, and different rates at times and management options, but in general, electrophysiology is very similar in adult and pediatric cardiology. And it ranges from benign ectopy, isolated premature atrial or ventricular contractions, might be tachyarrhythmias, supraventricular tachycardia, or ventricular arrhythmias. And then there's the whole category of bradycardia, sinus bradycardia, and heart block, either congenital or acquired. We're gonna to focus today on the tachyarrhythmias um, and the management there. Arrhythmias can be classified in any number of ways, um, both from the location, from the source, from the rates. The way, one of the ways I like to think about it is, are they sporadic? Is this an isolated problem? Um, most SVT is sporadic, has nothing to do with the anatomy usually, doesn't rely on a family history, um, and some ventricular tachycardia also occurs sporadically. There are certainly arrhythmias associated with congenital heart disease and there's a lot of etiologies for that. Um, with congenital heart defect, there might be a pressure or volume overload that results in stretch on the myocardium, which increases the likelihood of an arrhythmia. There are post-operative changes, both acutely with swelling, with fluid shifts, electrolyte shifts, and the effects of cardiopulmonary bypass, as well as late changes secondary to surgery. That's related to scar. Scar tissue is a great nidus for arrhythmia. There's an electrically inert area around which the electrical signal can propagate and that can lead to an arrhythmia. So definitely our adult congenital population has a lot of potential for arrhythmias. We can also then talk about the familial or inherited or genetic arrhythmias that do affect pediatric patients. The main ones being long QT syndrome, Brugada syndrome, and catecholaminergic, polymorphic, ventricular tachycardia, or CPVT. These are less common, and I'm not going to focus on them in great depth today, but we will touch base on that a little bit coming up. There are those arrhythmias that are associated with a structural problem of the heart, not necessarily an anatomic malformation during in utero, such as hypoplastic left heart syndrome, but where the heart has normal segmental anatomy, but there's something about the myocardium itself. That includes structural, or sorry, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and others. Finally, the broad, all-encompassing other category, which includes both infectious etiologies and autoimmune. Some examples are myocarditis. If there's an acute viral infection of the heart muscle, we often see a lot of ventricular ectopy, PVCs, non-sustained VT. Chagas infections, particularly in certain parts of the world, are the number one cause of AV block, so heart block with Chagas disease, in addition to other arrhythmias and dysfunction. Autoimmune disorders such as lupus antibodies, maternal lupus antibodies is the 
most common cause of congenital heart block or AV block. So there's a lot of things both about the ventricular myocardium, about the anatomy, about the native electrical conduction system, but sometimes also secondary issues that definitely cause arrhythmias in the pediatric community. The implications of arrhythmias in children very widely uh, may not be quite as devastating as we usually think about some arrhythmias in adults or as persistent. But typically, the first implication is that of symptoms, uh, which may or may not interrupt their daily activities. Some children are very symptomatic. Some children don't even notice or are not bothered by their arrhythmia, but it definitely has a potential to alter their daily activities. Less commonly, we might see ventricular dysfunction. This occurs very uncommonly, but in situations in which an arrhythmia is either incessant or unrecognized. So it doesn't necessarily correspond to the rate of tachycardia in fast. Faster heart rates, SVT at 280 beats per minute, is going to get a patient to presentation because they're going to be more symptomatic. But it's possible to have a form of SVT that might be physiologically not that fast, maybe 120 beats per minute. But if it's constant and incessant, that can lead to ventricular dysfunction. Another very common thing that we see in the younger population is the effects of an arrhythmia on their sports participation and their physical activity. And this is not just physical fitness, but also a socialization issue and part of a community and friendship. So it can be um, a great effect on them and important to recognize and control so that they can continue to participate in sports. Most pediatric arrhythmias, I would say, do not require sports restrictions. Everyone is going to have their particular situation, and on every slide I could give you the caveat that it will depend on the specific patient, their diagnosis, and their symptoms from it. But in general, things like supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, do not require sports restrictions. Children will often self-limit, however, if they do happen to get their SVT with sports or if they're just nervous about it, they might actually restrict themselves. Some sports, of course, and some activities do present unique risks. If someone has a hemodynamically stable rhythm, such as SVT, but they become quite dizzy with it, well, if you're in the middle of swimming, especially in open water, or skydiving, for example, the implications of being dizzy are much more severe than if you get dizzy while sitting in a chair. So there are certain arrhythmias and sports combinations that require a little bit more caution. When we think about arrhythmias, a lot of people also are very concerned about the risk of sudden death, which is real, but is much less common. Most pediatric arrhythmias can be very stable and safe, um, but again, it will depend on the patient. Sudden death from arrhythmias is usually diagnosis specific and is at increased risk with the inherited channelopathies with long QT syndrome or um, CPVT, the catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia whereas some patients have SVT only at rest and never with exercise. So again, um, the rate, the rhythm, and the patient-specific history is going to tell us whether or not they might have a risk of um, loss of consciousness or even a cardiac arrest. There's, of course, a lot of media coverage of the young, healthy athlete who passes away suddenly or has a cardiac arrest on a sports team, and arrhythmias are one of the differential diagnoses for that, but usually not the most common. But of course, it's a great concern, and that's always something that we want to be screening for and listening for. Superventricular tachycardia, though, by far and away is the most common thing that we see in pediatrics. And it's an umbrella term. Um, I know that there's a wide variety of comfort levels with SVT and with EP in general. So I'm going to give some basic definitions and broad overviews. Um, but we're not going to go into the management of each of these individually or the mechanisms necessarily. But just to talk about, in general, the umbrella term of SVT may imply a purely atrial arrhythmia, an ectopic atrial tachycardia, an automaticity where there's a revving up, an automatic depolarization from some location in the atrium. Might be atrial flutter, which is a reentrant tachycardia, a loop, a circuit that the electricity is just following around within the, the chamber, the atrium or atrial fibrillation. Although much, much less common than in adults, we do see it occasionally. It might be lone atrial fibrillation, a one-time episode in a teenager, or it might be atrial fibrillation in a patient with WPW or with congenital heart disease. 
Atrial arrhythmias and then AV ranch and tachycardias is the next type of SVT. So rotating between the atrium and the ventricle, and that's either through an accessory pathway like WPW or a concealed retrograde-only pathway, and AVNRT when we have dual AV nodal physiology, and that electrical loop is just rotating around within the AV node. Junctional tachycardia is another form of SVT that's much, much less common. So how common are they? Well, the incidence, the reports are varied, and it's hard in some diagnoses to get true numbers. In SVT, however, it's estimated to occur in as many as one in 100, sorry, excuse me, one in 250 children. And these kids typically have structurally normal hearts, their function is good, they are healthy, they just have this extra electrical connection which allows them to have SVT. Again, most commonly, it's an AV reentrant, either through an accessory pathway, which is AVRT, is our abbreviation for that, an AV, AV reentrant tachycardia, or AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. Of course, if this can happen in normal hearts, it also happens with increased frequency in congenital heart disease, in postoperative patients, and in adults as well. And that, as we mentioned, might be a pressure, a volume, a stretch load, a scar issue, sometimes it's just the anatomy itself. And I want to show you just one brief example. This is a severe form of congenital heart disease, a severe Epstein's anomaly. Here at the top of the screen you see that there's this, here's the tricuspid valve, which is apically displaced. There's failure of delamination of this septal tricuspid valve leaflet. So the leaflets are stuck and the opening is down here. So you've created this giant portion of the atrium and then a very small right ventricular cavity, and the right ventricular myocardium itself is abnormal and prone to arrhythmias. So this is a kind of population when we talk about monitoring, we're going to be monitoring much more closely than someone without or with a different form of congenital heart disease. As one quick example, this was a study looking at patients with Epstein's anomaly, 42 patients who needed surgery, so a severe form, and just under 20 of them had no history of arrhythmia or palpitations, no symptoms, and of this total group, 69% had inducible arrhythmias during an EP study. And in fact, 36% had WPW connection. So with certain types of congenital heart disease, our suspicion for arrhythmias is going to go way up. Ventricular tachycardia is something that a lot of people don't associate with pediatrics, but is possible. The simplest form is single isolated PVCs, again, that very common, 15% of infants, and these typically are present at birth and then just melt away without any intervention and without risk. 40% of adolescents may have PVCs on a halter monitor, and even up to 60% of congenital heart patients will have PVCs. When it becomes sustained or even non-sustained, it's a little bit more impressive, and we talk about ventricular tachycardia, the incidence is less well-defined, though, in reports about VT and pediatrics, about 50% in each report have congenital heart disease. So having congenital heart disease is definitely a risk factor and something that we'll look for. A few of the common types, Bellhausen's VT that you may see or have heard of, and I won't go into too much detail, but this is actually a really stable VT in it. In fact, it looks a lot like SVT, but doesn't respond to adenosine. It's a pretty narrow, complex arrhythmia, but a superior QRS axis. Right ventricular outflow tract tachycardia is another very common among the world of VT. Um, site of origin, which may be non-sustained, may be incessant and totally asymptomatic, or they might have sustained VT with symptoms, but because it's a very regular tachycardia, there's time for the ventricles to fill and eject, and they are not hemodynamically unstable. And of course, scar-related, as we talked about. To talk about the prevalence of the inherited arrhythmia syndromes, the top three being long QT, Brugada, and CPVT. Again, these are classified as ion channelopathies. There's an ion channel that has defective function, either increased or decreased function. Long QT syndrome, the most common being potassium channel and sodium channels, with an incidence of 1 in 2,500 individuals. In Brugada syndrome, the estimates are 1 in 3,500. This is a sodium channel defect, and here's an example of that ECG finding, this coved ST segment. And CPVT, much, much less common at 1 in 10,000. This is a quick example of CPVT. 
that has this classic what's called bidirectional ventricular ectopy, or VT, where here's a superior QRS axis and then an inferior QRS axis. These patients are a different population. They don't get palpitations typically. They don't um, have minor symptoms. These patients are at risk of sudden events, sudden collapse, because their arrhythmia would be a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So these patients have sudden events of syncope, presyncope, seizure, or cardiac arrest. Even within those diagnoses and those frequencies of diagnosis, however, the actual occurrence of an arrhythmia is even lower, depending on the patient, depending on their baseline testing and their history. So how do we monitor? Given that everything is possible, kids can have everything adults can have, how on earth do we monitor for this? Well, it depends. It's age dependent, and it depends on our index of suspicion. So what do we know about that patient? What's their family history? What's their medical history? I broadly classify children into three groups. You could, I call them pre-symptomatic. We could call them asymptomatic or healthy kids. So ones who are just growing and developing appropriately, there are no concerns. Monitoring there is going to be very different. It's usually if they present with some symptoms. In children with symptoms, we'll talk about how to monitor them, both for documentation and ongoing follow-up. And then there's those children with a known arrhythmia diagnosis or a risk of arrhythmias. It might be a family history of long QT, or it might be SVT as a baby and now they're seven years old. How do we monitor for arrhythmia occurrence? Well, the most important is going to be symptoms, and that's critical in both making the diagnosis and monitoring after the diagnosis is made. Symptoms are really crucial, and we have to rely on patients many times. But what if they're an infant? How do they report their symptoms to us? They certainly can't speak and tell their parents that they're having palpitations. So here I, it's all about anticipatory guidance with parents, and this is whether or not you're thinking about, you know, cystic fibrosis or cardiac-related issues or something completely unrelated. But babies generally have four very important jobs. They need to eat well. They need to grow and gain weight, breathe comfortably, and make urine. And if they're doing their four jobs, things are generally well. If any of those are off, then we need to screen them. And it's a very broad, nonspecific, but any of these things can bring a parent to have their child present for evaluation, where SVT might be one of the things that's identified. So poor feeding, poor urine output, fast or labored breathing, those are all reasons for a baby to be evaluated. And then with a little bit of an evaluation can quickly rule in or out an arrhythmia. If a baby has known SVT, then we actually teach the parents to auscultate the heart as one of the most reliable ways, counting, trying to find a pulse, putting their ear on the chest are less reliable. We'll actually give a parent after a new diagnosis a stethoscope and have them auscultate. They often have a lot of anxiety about this because they're not medical. However, they quickly get the hang of what sounds normal and what's too fast to count, and the actual number doesn't matter. So we do teach parents, and we have to rely on babies doing their normal jobs. When children are older, of course, then they can express to us if they're having symptoms. And that can be a wide variety, and sometimes it's pretty nonspecific. They might say, my heart's racing or skipping a beat. They might say it's beeping. I hear a lot of children say that. Sometimes it's described as anxiety or attributed to anxiety. They might say chest pain, and although SVT or arrhythmias are not typically painful, it might be a weird sensation in the chest that they don't know what else to call. I had one boy who would describe that his fox would be awoken, and it would make him very angry and upset if someone awoke his fox, and that was his SVT starting up. So kids can explain it in a lot of different ways. Fainting is usually not one of the presentations. It's rarely caused by an arrhythmia, and it has to be an unstable arrhythmia to really result in fainting if people have structurally normal hearts. But many symptoms in general are nonspecific. So when patients present with complaints, having it in the back of the mind as one of the differential diagnoses will give enough of an index of suspicion to help either ask additional questions or potentially pursue specific testing to rule out an arrhythmia. So how do we monitor? Well, non-invasive, of course, our bread and butter is electrocardiograms. And the ECGs are great both for diagnosis during symptoms initially, 
or as periodic screening to look for subclinical, look for secondary signs. Um, so we do screening ECGs. The Holter monitor is also great for initial diagnosis and for surveillance. But really, if it's going to be for initial diagnosis, that needs to be in a patient who has daily symptoms or multiple times a day. If they have less common symptoms, it's also reasonable to do a baseline Holter just to look for any irregular heartbeats, if there's atrial ectopy, PACs that might suggest their palpitations are in ectopic atrial tachycardia. So it's not always bad. It does it give you some good information. But the best way to catch the rhythm, it would need to be frequent symptoms. And then there's event and loop recorders, um, which are great for capturing less frequent episodes or very short episodes that don't allow a patient time to present for an electrocardiogram, or sudden episodes that come without warning and can be difficult to capture. Event and loop recorders have different forms. They typically are battery-operated portable devices that patients can hold on to for two to four weeks. Um, they may be handheld or attached to electrodes on the skin or even a patch on the skin. And they can record rhythms automatically, and they can also record when a patient has a symptom to give us symptom rhythm correlation. And sometimes the purpose of these is not to diagnose an arrhythmia, but actually to rule one out. If a patient is having frequent symptoms and they document their rhythm at that time and we see that it's normal sinus, then we can rule out an arrhythmia. So they're, hope they're definitely helpful for both diagnosis and ruling out. There's also invasive monitoring that we can do. Implantable loop recorders are subcutaneous devices that can automatically record and um, arrhythmias both fast and slow, and also give the option of the patient to activate it to record it during symptoms. I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next slide about the implantable loop recorders. For those patients who have an indication already and a pacemaker and ICD in place, those are great because we get constant rhythm monitoring and we can program those to record fast rhythms as well. Invasive monitoring, though, is really reserved for certain populations. A couple of examples are those with severe symptoms that have not yet been documented. I had, for example, a 14-year-old who was into dirt biking, and every time he would go up on a jump, he would lose consciousness suddenly in the air. So, of course, an ECG is not possible. Halter is not likely to help because it wasn't happening every day. So we actually put in a loop recorder to try and capture those automatically. Another example is that if a patient is at higher risk of arrhythmias but doesn't have of malignant arrhythmias but does not have an ICD indication, a 16-year-old girl with multiple episodes of near drowning actually then presented and had a diagnosis of long QT syndrome that we confirmed with genetic testing. She was really compliant with her beta blocker and was asymptomatic with nothing since starting beta blockers, and she really wanted to continue to play competitive soccer. So in addition to reinforcing the need for compliance with her medication, we agreed to implant one of these loop recorders for long-term monitoring and surveillance. So here's what a couple of them look like. These are implantable loop recorders, ILR for short. The two that we use most frequently and that I've used are Medtronic devices. So this is the Reveal, the older model, which was tiny when it came out, and now the newer version, which is called the Link. And these are implanted just below the skin on the anterior chest, and they can sense the electricity. This is an outpatient procedure. This smaller Link actually takes all of about five minutes to implant, and it can last for up to three years for continuous heart rhythm monitoring. Now, there's nothing attached to the patient, so it can't do a defibrillation, it can't pace, it's just purely a monitor. But the patients have the ability to have this monitor at home that connects wirelessly with their device and can automatically upload data to us about their heart rhythm. If they had a symptom, they can also send a manual transmission and call us and let us know, and we can see their heart rhythm without them having even to step foot in the hospital. So these implantable loop recorders are really fantastic for long-term monitoring. So moving on to treatment, and we're going to call treatment both management and cure. Um, again, there's a wide variety of um, comfort with electrophysiology in the community and the world at large, and there's a wide um, level of awareness that we have an ability to actually cure a lot of these arrhythmias. So we're going to talk about that, and I'll show you how we do it. So arrhythmia management, definitely a joint um, effort between primary care and the specialists. Um, both for the documentation originally and for ongoing evaluation and treatment. 
Um, again, we want to document it with one of these forms. There's typically additional testing in the form of an echocardiogram at initial diagnosis. It's not something that necessarily needs to be repeated frequently, but we do like to rule out subtle forms of congenital heart disease and structural heart disease that might not be symptomatic or have been detected in the past. So usually we do an echocardiogram at the beginning, maybe a stress test depending on the situation. And then if there's concern for familial process or a broader process, then we might do additional testing like a cardiac MRI, recommend family screening, blood work, et cetera. After the diagnosis is made, we then move into a maintenance phase. And then there's times when it, enough is enough and people just want it fixed for good and don't want to have to keep following it. So in general treatment options for arrhythmias, I classify three broad treatment options. And the first is simple observation. If it's a hemodynamically stable rhythm, if it's not interfering with their lifestyle, it's not causing ventricular dysfunction, there are many arrhythmias like SVT that we don't have to treat. We can just follow symptomatically. The second option is medications, which is very commonly used, of course. And the two ways of doing that are a daily preventative medication or a pill in the pocket. If someone has SVT and it only happens twice a year, but it lasts eight hours and they have to come to the emergency room every time, we might just give them a pill in the pocket that can abort the arrhythmia at home and prevent them from needing to come to the hospital. Ablation therapy, we're going to talk about more and do a little bit of show and tell. Um, so ablation therapy is a great therapy that I'm going to go into. There are other treatment options, again, depending on the patient and the diagnosis, from a pacemaker, long QT syndrome, for example, if you have bradycardia or variability of the heart rate, that's times where you're more likely to have an arrhythmia. So we might electively put a pacemaker to prevent an arrhythmia in long QT syndrome. Not common, but it's a treatment tool. Implantable cardioverter defibrillators, of course, if you have unstable arrhythmias that need to be shocked. There are also some surgical therapies. And usually these are in conjunction with a congenital heart operation, but there are some arrhythmias that are such catecholamine-sensitive and driven arrhythmias that we might actually go in and do a sympathectomy, cut off that sympathetic innervation to the heart to try to minimize life-threatening arrhythmias. So lots of tools in the toolbox. And whether or not we treat really, again, depends on the patient. What type of arrhythmia do they have? What is their burden of arrhythmia? What are their comorbidities? Do they have contraindications to a beta blocker? Do they have other reasons why they might be unstable, even though it's just SVT? What is their risk of sudden death? Again, those patients with arrhythmias and sudden death are typically congenital heart disease if they have ventricular dysfunction, the inherited channelopathies that have a risk of polymorphic VT or ventricular fibrillation, and WPW and the ability to have pre-excited atrial fibrillation. Most other arrhythmias are not necessarily life-threatening, but there are definitely some that do carry risk of sudden death. The other part that we have to take into account are what is that patient's hopes and dreams? What do they like to do for their sports? What are their job aspirations? And we'll talk more about that. If we do treat classically, and very often, the first line is medications. And everyone, I'm sure, remembers the Von Williams classification for antiarrhythmic med medications, with our most common here highlighted beta blockers, propranolol in the babies, and even in older kids. But there's a wide variety of medications that we might use. I've highlighted some of them, but again, there's going to be patient-specific factors, experiential factors, function, et cetera, in choosing the right antiarrhythmic. EP studies. Okay, so this is what I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. It's become very commonly used treatment for arrhythmias in pediatrics, and it's increasing in its frequency and recommendations. So EP studies, um, just to give some background information, are interventional transcatheter procedures that are done on an outpatient basis. Some patients might spend one night, but our goal is usually for patients to be discharged the same day. And it typically takes about three to four hours in the lab. It, we utilize intracardiac electrical signals and pacing maneuvers in order to look at the normal conduction system and to induce an arrhythmia. We then look at those signals to identify what type of arrhythmia it is specifically and where the arrhythmia substrate is, whether that's an accessory pathway, an extra connection across the mitral or tricuspid valve annulus, is it dual AV nodes? 
with a fast and a slow pathway, or is there a spot that's automatically firing? During the procedure, we can also then eliminate that arrhythmia substrate via ablation. So ablation is where we actually zap it and get rid of it, and we can do that either with heat, which is radio frequency, or with freezing technology, which is called cryoablation. So radio frequency ablations, the most common using the heat, have been performed since the early 90s in pediatrics. There were much coarser, much more high-risk options that were attempted earlier than that, but radio frequency has been a really safe and effective therapy that's evolved a lot and grown in its use. It's often even the first-line therapy for some patients um, for some of the indications that we've talked about, and I'll review again. So these procedures are classically done under fluoroscopy, so that's x-ray, and it's a constant x-ray beam that's turned on as we step on the pedal. And this, of course, is radiation exposure, which could cause an acute risk of skin burns during the procedure itself, though those were fairly uncommon. But the greater concern is the longer-term risk of malignancy associated with cumulative radiation exposure. And so in all forms of medicine, there's the ALARA principle where we need to use as low as reasonably achievable amount of radiation. And that has really skyrocketed in terms of how we can achieve that over the last 10 to 15 years, and really in many centers just in the last few years. Since the early 2000s, several different non-fluoroscopic imaging systems have been introduced for electrophysiology studies. So I want to introduce you guys to those today. Many of you may have patients who've already had this done or will be having it done, but it's a really great tool and it's helped in our safety and in our success with these procedures. So non-fluoroscopic imaging is a three-dimensional mapping system that allows us to create a model of the heart chamber of interest, typically the right atrium, to visualize catheter movement without having to step on the x-ray, to create a map of the arrhythmia substrates, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and then to keep track of where we've been and where we've put our ablation lesions. So I'll go through how we get from the patient coming into the room to this pretty picture at the end. So we utilize these non-fluoroscopic catheters, um, which are visualized through a GPS-like localization system. Patients have three patches on the front of their chest and three on their back that provide um, points for localizing the catheter within the body. The catheters, here's a couple of examples, have electromagnetic sensors on them. You see these silver rings along the catheters. This one has many sensors on it that can sense the intrinsic electrical activity of the heart. All of them can also pace the heart for diagnostic testing. And then one of them has a specialized tip that either heats up or freezes, and that's the one that eliminates the arrhythmia focus. Here's a picture of our cath one of our cath labs at Children's Hospital. You can see our technician is setting up for a patient. Here's the table that they lay on. There's these patches that are prepared. Here's one that's going to go on the front of the chest and some round patches on the front that are attached to electrodes. Here's the x-ray, which we often keep off to the side unless we need it. Anesthesiologist is at the head of the bed. We have eight computer screens on the boom and four to five over here. So it's a very technology-heavy procedure. And there are operators both at the patient manipulating the catheters and over here at the computers doing the diagnostic work and controlling the pacing. I also want to draw your attention to these tracks on the floor in this silver door for a really unique feature of our lab, which is pretty rare finding in the world. This is a hybrid cath lab and MRI suite. So a patient can have a procedure, and then the bed can move into the MRI suite and get intra-procedural cardiac MRI images. This is predominantly for research purposes at this time, but could be really potentially valuable um, in performing these with accuracy and precision. Okay, so I'm going to play this video, and this is a typical screen that we use when we're doing our non-fluoroscopic mapping. So as I start it, the first thing we'll see is this catheter. This is our mapping catheter, and you can see it floating up. It's just being floated through the iliac vein from the femoral vein up into the IVC. 
And as the catheter touches the wall of the IVC, it creates this gray structure called our map. That's, you can see there's two views, the little face, here he's facing a little bit to the left, so we're looking at the right side of the heart. This is a right anterior oblique view. And here's the face going the other way, so an orthogonal view. Now we're in the left anterior oblique view. So without any x-ray cameras or radiation, we're getting two views of what we're doing. Now at the bottom, we have our electrical signals, and the white lines are surface electrocardiogram. Looks a little different because the the timing and the duration, the sweep speed on the computer is different, but this is a normal surface electrocardiogram, and then we have each of the electrodes on each of our catheters is going to show a signal. Now this is a flat green line because we're in the vein, and so there's no electrical activity in the vein. So now we're being oriented to the screens and we're looking at it. Now, once we've gotten up into the IVC, we come into the right atrium. And if I can ask you to trust me that this is the right atrium, we're going to move our catheter gently around this chamber. And as we touch the wall, we're going to create this three-dimensional model of the right atrium. You can see there's a spike here on the bottom with this blue line. It's a sharp spike where that signal is coming from, where the catheter is touching the atrial tissue and there's local depolarization. Again, up in the SVC, there's no signal. We come back down into the heart. And what we do is we just slowly and gently sweep around the heart and touch all the walls. We're doing this knowing the anatomy, knowing how to move the catheters around from our history of using fluoroscopy, knowing our structural landmarks, and also looking at our electrical signals. Here on the bottom, if I can draw your attention to the blue line, there's some ectopy as we tickle the heart and cause some PACs, premature atrial complexes. But we can also tell things about where we are based on the signal that we see. We're looking for structures that we know, the tricuspid valve annulus, the AV node is on the septal wall. So we're looking at both the electrical signals and watching where we're moving and knowing what the anatomy is and how to, how to move catheters within the heart. So we take our time. The catheters are not sharp ends. They're very blunt. We move them slowly. Um, there's some chance of injuring a heart valve or the wall of the blood vessel or the chamber, but you have to push pretty hard, and we tend to not push hard. We know how to move them gently. Now, one of the structures that we worry most about is our AV node, our atrioventricular node. You're going to see the catheter float over here on the right side of our screen um, to an area where the AV node lives, and the AV node is on the inner surface. It's on the endocardial surface of the heart. So we have to be very careful not to bump into that because it, we can mechanically injure it and cause heart block. So we're conscious, conscientious of that and constantly looking for that. Now on the left side of the screen, you see that the view has changed a little bit and there's this orange. That's actually showing us where we have been, where we've actually moved the catheter and touched the walls. The computer program automatically smooths out the surfaces and makes a nice pretty shape for us. Um, but we can also we can look at it in either way and know exactly where we've been and make sure we have all of the anatomy. Here, we're looking for that AV node signal. There's a sharp deflection. It signifies the AV node. So we put a little marker there. We can make this yellow dot to mark where exactly that structure is as a safety mechanism. So we're going to go around, get the basic anatomy, learn the patient's you know, chamber sizes, and then we're going to use this as a basic model for which we can bring all the other catheters into the heart. Moving forward, now we have our IVC, and you can see coming up the inferior vena cava, this is a longer catheter with lots of electrodes on it. This is called the coronary sinus catheter, and it's here's the coronary sinus. Now this is a little bit of abstract art, but here's the right atrial body. Here's the superior vena cava at the top, the inferior vena cava at the bottom, and our coronary sinus which is a posterior vein that lies right behind the mitral valve annulus. It allows us to go out and see the left-sided electrical signals without having to go into the left atrium. Of course, the left atrium and the left ventricle, if we were to get an air bubble that traveled or a little blood clot that formed, and those were to go into a coronary artery, it could cause myocardial ischemia, 
or to the brain, it could cause a stroke. So we're really cautious about going over there, and we do things like give blood thinners heparin to prevent those from happening. But if we don't have to go to the left, we don't want to. And this coronary, or this CS catheter will slide right out there, and we're able to position it. So now we can see all of our left-sided signals from this catheter. So now we have different catheters in position within the heart, and we've never stepped on X-ray. So typically we'll use four catheters. Not everyone will have four. Sometimes we have three or two, but typically they're positioned in different places within the heart. And then where they touch the myocardium, they produce electrical signals. And so we can watch how the electricity moves throughout the heart and their sharp depolarizations. Here's our AV node, and it's straddling the tricuspid valve, so we get a little atrial signal, uh, an AV node signal or hiss. And then here is the QRS, or the ventricular depolarization. So we get these patterns. And the rest of the case, the catheters mostly stay in place. We move this one catheter around to, to measure intervals, to look at timing it, to try and get SVT going. So this is our moving catheter, our roving catheter, and this is also the one that the tip is going to be able to heat up to eliminate the arrhythmia. So once our catheters are in position, we have all of our signals, we make normal measurements, look at the normal function of the AV node, and then we do pacing maneuvers to actually try to trigger the arrhythmia that we're suspecting. If there's no suspicion, if it's just a diagnostic study, then we have basic pacing maneuvers in the atrium and the ventricle looking for both SVT or ventricular arrhythmias. Once we find that specific point, if we found an accessory pathway on the tricuspid valve annulus, we can then bend our catheter down to that spot and turn on radiofrequency ablation and watch for elimination of that connection. Being able to do this all without the use of fluoroscopy is really incredible. It's reduced the radiation exposure significantly in pediatrics, and in many cases, we use zero fluoroscopy, and which totally eliminates radiation risks, not just to the patient, the small child, but also to all the staff in the room, which is not insignificant. It also aids us in localization of the arrhythmia focus, any gaps in ablation lines, and I'll explain that, and really improves the accuracy. So these two pictures are examples of an ectopic atrial tachycardia. So SVC, right atrium, the main body, and the IVC below. Now our sinus node lives at the SVC right atrial junction. So the sinus node is up here. It's also an epicardial structure, so we don't worry about injuring that as much. But if this were a sinus rhythm, we would see that the earliest signals would come from that area, and it's a color coding where red is the earliest and blue is the latest on the rainbow spectrum. This patient's rhythm, we could see that the earliest signal was this red area over here. And in fact, that's where we found the focal source of the arrhythmia and did our ablation with each of these red dots representing points at which we turned on the radio frequency energy. Now, when we move to this one, this is kind of a fun tool and just um, showing the propagation of the arrhythmia in this patient. And you can see that it starts at that cluster of red dots and spreads out, emanates out from there, traveling through the atrium like a wave. So for focal arrhythmia, it's nice to see. Where this can also be really helpful, having this visual aid to watch the rhythm move through the heart, is if we had atrial flutter, which often involves this little connection from the tricuspid valve down to the IVC. So we would do a, an ablation line, do lesions all across that region. Now. If we did the ablation line and then still were able to induce flutter and our electrical signal showed us there was still some point that it was getting through, we can do one of these propagation maps and see exactly where that spot is and focus our ablation there. So not only does it make pretty pictures, it reduces, arrhythmia, or it reduces the radiation exposure, it also is fantastic in helping us localize arrhythmias and still persistent um, spots of electrical conduction where we believe we've already ablated. So really an amazing tool that's just getting better and better each year. The technology is involving, there's multiple companies who are doing this, um, and really improving the accuracy and the speed with which we can do these procedures. These are very effective procedures for pediatric arrhythmias. In SVT, 
success rates during the procedure to be able to eliminate that ability to have SVT is greater than 90% in most reports, often 96, sometimes even higher. So really successful therapy. Even in ventricular tachycardia, it used to be reported that there was a 60% success rate for pediatric VT ablations, and that's really increased to 90% in many cases. Congenital heart disease does present additional hurdles and often complicate not complications, but um, complicating factors that can make it more difficult to have a successful ablation. So those success rates are a little bit lower. For example, if a patient has a Fontan circuit, um, you can't get into the, most of the right atrium from the Fontan directly from the IVC. And so there may be anatomical obstructions to getting where you need to go. There might be scar tissue, which makes it very difficult. There might be multiple arrhythmias, so you might ablate two of them and another one pops up um, or three more show up. So congenital heart disease is definitely a more complex group of patients, but can also really benefit from ablation therapy. In some reports, medications are only effective in about 50% of congenital heart disease arrhythmias, so ablation is a great option for them as well. There's a present but very low risk of recurrence after an acutely successful ablation. So in the EP lab, we will often wait for 30 minutes after the ablation is successful. That way a little bit of swelling goes down and we can make sure that it hasn't come back. At that point, if we see no evidence of any arrhythmia, then we conclude and call it an acute success. Now as there's continued healing and evolution of that tiny scar that we've made, there may be a chance of a recurrence, about 5 to 10% with most SVT ablations. Again, a little bit higher chance in congenital heart disease, but a really effective therapy. It's also very low risk. Now, there are some risks. Of course, it's an intracardiac procedure. It's not open heart surgery. In fact, there's not even any stitches on the veins. It's just a Band-Aid. But there are some risks of the procedure that we would go through with patients before so they can make an educated decision about whether or not it's the right therapy for them. Overall, a very small chance of a complication, about 1% or less, with the most serious being heart block, potentially uh, injury, pericardial perforation or an effusion, or an embolic event, a stroke, or coronary artery injury. And those rates are very, very low. They're also for all comers. So if we have a 19-year-old congenital heart patient who's had four surgeries and has heart failure, the potential complications for an EP study are higher. If it's a 15-year-old with a structurally normal heart and no comorbidities, their chance of each of these complications may be, in fact, much lower. So always important to be aware of, but in general, a very safe procedure. So when do we do it? What are the indications? And when should we be referring? Or should we be asking you to refer patients for ablation? Well, of course, hemodynamically unstable arrhythmias. They need probably multiple interventions multiple types of therapy. Arrhythmias that are refractory to medications. If it's SVT and very stable, but they have it despite being on a prophylactic medication, then ablation is a great option. If a patient has an adverse reaction to a medication or is simply averse to chronic medications, they are adamant about not being on beta blockers for the rest of their life, or not the rest of their life, but even for a year. Some people don't want to do it or if they're a severe asthmatic and beta blockers might be a relative contraindication, then ablation might be the very first line of therapy. If there's a significant arrhythmia burden that's either interfering with their life or certainly resulting in ventricular dysfunction, then I would recommend ablation. Wolf-Parkinson-White, um, an exception, and a special case within pediatric arrhythmia population because most of WPW is a very stable orthodromic atrioventricular tachycardia that's not life-threatening, but they do have that risk of pre-excited atrial fibrillation, which can result in cardiac arrest. So certainly if they've had either of those, we would recommend ablation very quickly. Or if they've had unexplained syncope, not a classic vasovagal faint, um, kind of a, a suspicious syncopal episode in ECG with WPW, they would be a very good candidate for ablation. Or those with high-risk pathways. There's also the category where it might, because, might be because their arrhythmia, even a simple SVT, would preclude them from pursuing certain jobs, like a military career or a pilot. 
um, and that's a great indication for ablation where we can just eliminate that procedure all, or that diagnosis altogether. We typically do these procedures when electively, if they're not urgent, when kids are about 25 kilogram. Each practice and each physician will have a little different threshold for when they feel comfortable doing it. Maybe 20 kilograms, maybe 30 kilograms, but in general, it's when kids are about seven or eight years of age. They're big enough that the risks of the procedure are similar to that as an adult or a fully grown child. Of course, if there's an urgent indication, we can do these procedures in anyone, including infants. So if a baby comes in with SVT that's refractory to medications and is so persistent that it's causing ventricular dysfunction and they're requiring support such as ECMO support, if we can't get that rhythm under control, then we might be um, forced to do the ablation early. So there are certainly indications when we would need to do it at a young age, and it can be done safely. The risks are incrementally higher than those of an older child, but it certainly can be done. Only very quickly, I'm going to give you a slight preview to the advances in cardiac rhythm management devices. So pacemakers, a lot of kids actually do need pacemakers. Um, and one of the newer technologies that we've not yet seen in pediatrics as much, but is starting to be used in adults are these leadless pacemakers. If you haven't seen them, they're pretty incredible pieces of technology. This tiny little device is inserted into the right ventricle and has no leads, which eliminates many of the complications that we see with transvenous pacemakers and defibrillators. So quite an amazing technology coming, coming down the pike. And then for the last few years, there's been a subcutaneous ICD, which has nothing inside the veins. You don't have to access the heart. It's entirely under the skin. It hasn't been used as much in pediatrics because the generator that's over here on the axillary line is quite huge. It's gotten better. It's still pretty big for kids, but is another evolving technology that we have in our toolbox. So in conclusion, arrhythmia diagnoses, which are very broad, requires an index of suspicion. You need to document it in a couple of different ways or in a number of different ways. And then sometimes it requires a lot of patients to make that initial diagnosis. But as long as kids aren't collapsing, most SVT is very safe and we can take our time and diagnose it properly. All types are possible, but SVT is the most common and is generally not life-threatening. And then our management options mainly include observation, medications, and ablation, which is a really safe and effective therapy for the elimination, permanent cure of arrhythmias. And the non-fluoroscopic procedures have really made this procedure just fantastic, um, both from a safety and a success point of view. Thank you for hanging with me and listening. If I can answer any questions, please feel free to jump in. You can also contact me individually after this presentation. Are there any questions? Um, and don't forget to star six to unmute. I'll fill in the space a little bit. I love EP and I get really excited to talk about it. So if there are certain topics that are of interest, let me know. Um, if you have cases to discuss, I'm always open. Um, and I look forward to slowly meeting people in the area uh, as I get reacquainted with Northern Virginia and the district. I'll hang on for a few more minutes, but thank you so much for joining. Have a great weekend.